Hey guys, Jay here with Word of Advice TV. In a lot of my videos in the comments section, I get a lot of comments from new guys, like new technicians in the field, HVAC technicians, or maybe they're still in school and they're about to go out into the field, or maybe they're doing some kind of a apprenticeship program. And some of them ask me, what advice can I give to a brand new guy that's just going out into the field? Just some practical, basic life advice as a tech that has been doing this for a while. And I've only been doing this for maybe six years. I have some experience, but my hope is that some people watching this are gonna be guys that have 10, 20, 30 years of experience. You probably have a wealth of knowledge. It would be totally awesome if you can share your wisdom with us as well in the comment section below what advice you have for new guys. That would be totally awesome. But anyways, let's begin with my tips. I got 10 tips. I sat down and I thought about it. What can I tell new guys? What can I advise them? And I came up with a list of 10 things or 10 advice points that I could give to new techs that are just starting out in the field. So let's begin with tip number one is to always ask questions, especially if you're in school. When I was in school, I was known as the guy that always asked all the questions. Even if the question seems stupid, or maybe it seems like everybody should know this by now, if I didn't quite understand it, or I didn't completely understand it, I still asked the questions. And pretty soon, you know, the rest of the class started appreciating me, because a lot of people, you know, they're embarrassed to ask, you know, people are going to look at them like, hi, you're dumb. But it was me, you know, I was always the one asking the questions and pretty soon my classmates actually started depending on me. They'd be like, hey Jay, can you ask the teacher that? Because they didn't want to ask it, so they asked me. So I asked all the questions. I was the guy that took a bunch of notes. I took all the notes. I copied the pictures off the board, you know, I drew them myself. I took pictures. So if you don't understand something, always, always ask the question. Because you're not always going to have an opportunity like that. Chances are, the teacher that's teaching you has a few master licenses, and a lot of them will have a lot of experience in the field, and to top it off, you have a bunch of other students that are learning for the same thing as you. So it's a good community to ask questions and get the answers while you have the chance to do so. At first, the teacher was pretty irritated that I would constantly question everything, but pretty soon, you know, the teacher got used to it as well. So at the end of the class, the question would be asked, is there any questions? If there's no questions, Everybody would look at me, Jay, do you have any questions? And of course, during class I was taking notes, so if I wrote down some questions to ask, of course I would ask them. So always ask questions and take notes. Take notes of the stuff, take notes of the answers that you get. So for my time in college, I went for two years, right? One year was residential, one year was commercial. I got all my notes from those two years. They're all organized. This thing probably weighs like 20 pounds. So if I need to reference something, if I can't find something on Google, I can always go back to like, you know, electrical diagrams or refrigeration and look up info in my notes that I took while I was in school. And even if you don't end up using all the notes you took and all the handouts that you saved, just the fact that you saved them all, you wrote all the notes, you drew the pictures, just the fact that you did all that, you organized it, it'll help you remember all that stuff and retain it a lot better if you do that than if you just listen. And one last point on this, Everybody loves an eager beaver. You know, if you have a positive attitude, if you have a learning attitude, you're eager to learn, you wanna know as much as you can, the people teaching you or the people explaining, they, they see that. You know, if you're eager to learn, they're even more eager to teach you. And this helps with your job as well. If your employer sees that you're eager to learn, you're here to learn everything they can teach you, and you're eager to learn from the guy that you're riding along with, you wanna learn, 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 people catch up to that and they know that you wanna learn. If they see you taking notes as you're asking them questions, they know that if they're telling you stuff, you're actually paying attention. So hopefully this was enough motivation for you to start asking questions all the time and taking notes. All right, let's move on to point number two. And point number two is to practice as much as you can while you have the opportunity to do so. So if your school offers you all the materials, all the tools that you need, practice as much as you can. Stay after class if they allow you and practice your brazing. You know, they provide all the solder, they provide the pipe, they provide the torches, or at least my school did. So stay after class. Take some extra time to practice as much as you can, you know, to refine your skills, to get better at bending sheet metal or brazing, soldering, all that stuff. When I went to school, I was fortunate. We did have a lot of opportunities like that and everything was provided for us. So for brazing class, I would make a 3D cube with all these pipes and different little fittings and all the stuff that I could cram into there. So imagine how much solder and brazing practice I got doing that. And then at the end, we were able to pressure test it as well. We would pump that thing up with nitrogen and throw it into a tub with water. If there's bubbles, well then you did a pretty bad job at soldering, do it again. And when we had sheet metal class, 
the teacher offered us as just extra credit. It wasn't even extra credit. No, just if you wanted to, you can do some extra sheet metal work on the side. So he gave us a template and you could build a rose out of sheet metal, you know, for your wife on Valentine's Day. And of course I did that, you know, I made a rose out of sheet metal and that was a ton of practice of cutting out sheet metal, bending it, forming it and all that stuff. And at the end I spray painted it, it looked really nice. So long story short, if you have the opportunity to practice your HVAC skills, do so if it's completely provided for you why not put in the extra effort to practice and tip number three is to get an HVAC job or a job in the field while you're still going to school I know this may not be possible for everybody but for the most part it is possible when I went to school I think we had either 25 or 28 students after the first semester so those two years they have four semesters right two semesters for the first year, two semesters for the second year. After the first semester, so after half a year, 20 of us already had a job in the field, which just goes to show you how high of a demand there is for HVAC technicians. But anyways, if 20 of us were able to get a job, that means it's fairly easy to get a job while you're in school. And a lot of employers are looking for new guys so that they can train them from the bottom up. And of course, they pay new guys a lot less than they would a guy that already has 20 years of experience. When I got my first HVAC job, I was a waiter at like a nursing home. So I was making like 17 bucks an hour. When I got my first HVAC job, I got a pay cut, you know, from 17 bucks to 12.50 an hour. And I took it just so I can have the experience. And I'll tell you, that is tremendously helpful to have a job and most of the jobs will actually allow you to take the company vehicle to the school before you go home but anyways it's tremendously helpful to have a job as you're going to school because you have the real life experience I mean you're experiencing this stuff every day and then when you come to school you actually know what questions to ask you know this is not just foreign to you you're actually working on it in the field so for myself and all my classmates that got an HVAC job a lot of us did take a pay cut but none of us regretted it. It was well worth it getting a job in the field while you're still in the school, even if it's a pay cut. I know that's not possible for everybody. I mean, I had a wife at that time already, but if you already have like three or four kids and you can't afford that, I mean, I understand if there's not the opportunity, you have to keep your job, you have to keep making a living. But if you have the chance, do get a job in the field while you're going to school, it will help you out a lot. And one last thing on this is, don't be afraid to do some stuff for free. So for example, if you're on a new job, you know, you just got hired and the senior tech is installing an air conditioner for his buddy, ask to tag along with him, help him out for free. So spend a half a day just for the experience helping the guy putting in an air conditioner. It will help you a lot. You're gonna learn a lot from this guy that's been doing it for like 20 years. So don't be afraid to do some stuff for free once in a while if it gets you good experience. And tip number four is do not be afraid to jump ship. Don't be afraid to change jobs. The number one person to look out for you is you yourself. So do what's best for you and your family. If your job is not paying you that well, if they're not treating you well, HVAC technicians are in pretty high demand. You should be looking for a different job that has better hours, better benefits. It's more flexible. You have more time off. It has steady hours and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I guarantee you there is better opportunities out there. You just have to steadily look for them. In fact, one time when I switched from one job to another, I got an increase of $10 an hour just from switching jobs. The hours were way more steady. It was easier work and it, the, all the way around, you know, the benefits, everything was better and I got $10 more an hour. I know it may be a little bit intimidating to switch jobs, especially if you're already comfortable where you are, you know how everything works, but if it's gonna make your life better, you're gonna get better pay, you're gonna get better hours, it's definitely worth it. Do look for better opportunities. And on that note, that same class that I went to, we had the same class, we didn't jump around from class to class, we had the same teacher for the whole two years. So that whole class that I was with, by the time we were done with our fourth semester, that by the time we were done with our second year, almost all of us in the class were either on our second or third job. So don't be afraid to jump ship, but on that note, don't just walk into the office and throw the keys on the desk and tell your boss, I'm quitting today, right now, immediately. Don't do that, don't burn bridges. Whenever you're quitting, be very polite about it, you know, thank them for their time, for the opportunity that they gave you, for them teaching you so much at this job. Be polite when you're leaving, make friends before you go, not enemies. 
because you never know when you're going to meet those people in your life in the future or maybe circumstances are going to play a funny joke on you and you're going to have to come back at one point and work for these people again. So definitely don't burn any bridges when you're leaving. Be very courteous in your exit. And on that note, one last note on this topic, when you're leaving on my first job when I put in my two week notice, they let me go immediately the same day. And that happens to a lot of technicians. I've talked to a lot of my buddies from school. That happens quite a bit in the field. Not all companies do that, but just so you're aware, there is a chance that when you put in your two week notice, they might let you go immediately right that same day. They'll have somebody give you a ride to your house. You pick up your tools or whatever you had in the company vehicle, take them with you and you're let go immediately the same day. So if you're putting in your two week notice, keep in mind that you may be terminated on the spot that day. So have some cash saved up or be ready to switch to the next job right away. All right, moving on. Tip number five is don't splurge on tools right away. The very first thing when I came to school, you know, on the first semester, the teacher handed out a list to all the students and said, here's the recommended list of tools that you should get. And right before this, you know, I had just finished my two year accounting degree. I wasn't a very handy guy. I didn't have much tools at home. And thank goodness I actually decided not to be an accountant. I wanted to do something with my hands. That's how I ended up doing HVAC. But anyways, as I'm looking at this list, I'm like, holy moly, you know, I don't have most of this stuff. So I decided to splurge and just buy everything on that list, which was over a thousand bucks. Turns out that a good like third of all the stuff that I bought, I really didn't need. So it's still sitting at my house just collecting dust. So my recommendation is to just get the basics. You know, your nut drivers, your screwdrivers, a meter, some gauges, just the basic stuff. Don't get anything fancy until you have to down the road. In fact, it's even better if you're already at your job and then as you go along, you're like, oh, I need this tool. You know, you get one tool at a time. Don't just get the whole bulk, everything right at once. Unless, of course, you're just loaded and you have money just falling out of your pockets as you're walking and you can afford to just buy everything. Then by all means, just buy everything. It's not going to hurt. But if you don't have unlimited cash, then by all means, you don't have to buy everything that's recommended. Just buy the basics and then get stuff down the road as you go. In fact, most employers nowadays actually prefer to give you all the tools that you need on the job. So they actually provide all the tools. They don't want you to bring your own tools, or at least that's what it's been like for me and many of the techs that I know. And tip number six is to subscribe to this channel and like this video. But really, tip number six is do not badmouth anybody ever, especially if you're on an interview. If you badmouth your previous employer on an interview, you're almost guaranteed not to get that job. And of course that applies to your coworkers, your bosses, your supervisors. It's generally just a bad idea to badmouth people, even to your buddies or coworkers. So try to get into the habit early on of not talking smack about other people because then people will start knowing you as somebody that talks bad about other people and they don't trust you as much. You know, as you're talking to somebody, they're thinking in their head like, oh wow, if this guy is talking like this with me, that means when I'm not here, the next guy he talks to, he'll be talking bad about me while I'm not here. And I've noticed this many, many times that the people that don't talk smack about other people are generally liked a lot more than everybody else. So if you want to be liked at your workplace, resist the urge. I know it's natural to talk smack about other people. It feels good to bring somebody else down, but just resist that and instead get into a habit of not talking bad. In fact, in the Bible, supposedly one of the wisest men that has ever lived, King Solomon, he wrote a bunch of Proverbs. One of those Proverbs, he wrote that only a fool talks bad things about others, but a wise man will keep his mouth shut. So take that as some good advice from the wisest man in history. All right, guys, moving on. Tip number seven is to be respectful and helpful when you're riding along. So whenever you get your first job, chances are for the first couple of weeks, week, two, three, some jobs even go as far as like a whole month of ride alongs. When you're riding along, be as helpful and be respectful when you're riding along with a senior tech. And just like in school, ask a lot of questions and take notes. Senior techs love it when you take notes. That way they see that you're taking them seriously. And also, don't be one of those guys that just stands there and humbly watches as the senior tech is changing out a blower motor, for example, and you're just humbly watching him, you're learning, right? Don't be like that. Hold a flashlight, you know, give him a screwdriver, give him a nut driver, ask him, can I hold this? Can I take the door? Can I prop this up? Be helpful, be respectful. 
If the guy that you're riding along with sees that you're respectful, you're helpful, you're not a smart ass, you don't pretend like you know everything, he's gonna like you. Naturally, he's gonna like you and he's gonna be more willing to help you. And down the road, when you're on your own and you call him up to ask him for some advice, he's not gonna ignore your call. He's actually gonna pick up and be happy to talk to you. And when you're riding along with them, if they like you, they're gonna be more than happy to answer your questions. They're gonna be a lot more willing to explain things to you. When I just started my HVAC career, most of the guys, I would always ask them, hey, do you mind if I just look through your tool bag? I'm not trying to be creepy. I just wanna see what you have, you know, so I know what to get for myself. And most of the time they're like, oh yeah, go ahead, just dig through the bag. And as I'm looking through their tools and stuff, a lot of times if they like you, they're gonna start pointing out the tools that are their favorites, they're gonna start telling you things that you must have. Your tool bag should always have this, this, and this. In the beginning, it's really helpful to have a guy that has 30 years of experience tells you what you absolutely must have in your tool bag. And that's part of the reason why I made a video like that myself, what's inside of a service technician's tool bag, just to show you what's in my bag in case there's people that are curious what they can add to their tool bag to make their life easier on the job as they go from job to job. There's a bunch of cool little tools and trinkets that can make your daily life at work a lot easier. Another thing I like to do is look at their van, how they organized it, what they have in their van or their company vehicle. That also helps a lot, you know, what they have closest to the door, what kind of organization boxes they use, what's easier to access and stuff. If you ride along with a couple different people, you can get a pretty good idea of what's a good tool bag and how you should organize your vehicle. And this all starts by being helpful and respectful to the guy that you're riding along with. And tip number eight is to have a pair or a set of extra clothing and maybe some socks and shoes in your work vehicle. That is gonna definitely save you someday. I learned this the hard way. One time I was working on an air conditioner. I mean, it was cloudy, so it didn't seem like it was gonna rain. It was drizzling just a little bit. It started drizzling. And by that time I had already hooked up my gauges. I know you're not supposed to hook up gauges when it's wet outside, but when I started, it wasn't raining yet or drizzling. So I thought I would beat it. So I had my gauges hooked up. I was doing my thing. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the heavens opened up and my goodness, it was a downpour. And to make matters worse, I don't know if there was a downspout or whatever was on top of me, it seemed like there was a waterfall just pouring down on top of my head. Luckily I was smart enough to bring two kneeling pads, those big ones, so I threw both of those on top of my tool bag. And while I was scurrying about, you know, I had to take my gauges off. So I had to take the gauges off real quick. I had the door taken off, the electrical section was open, so I had to put all that back together. By the time I took the gauges off, put the door back on, I was just drenched from head to toe, just completely wet. Luckily, the two mats that I put on top of my tool bag kept most of my tools and stuff inside my bag relatively dry. They got a little bit wet, but nothing was damaged. So that was the day when I learned the hard way to have an extra pair of clothes. Cause after that one call, I still had to go to another three calls. So for the rest of the day, I was completely drenched. And it kind of sucks, you know, to be in wet jeans, wet underwear, socks and shoes. It was just kind of miserable. If I had some extra clothes, that would have been great. And in the winter, have an extra pair of gloves maybe, some more socks, a sweater or a coat, maybe even throw a small little winter shovel into your truck. Or if it's like really muddy or you get really dirty from some kind of an install or whatever it is that you're doing, it's always nice to have a set of extra clothes or a shirt or whatever. It's gonna help you out someday. You're gonna remember me and you're gonna thank me. And tip number nine is to be confident. And this one is crucial, very important for any new guys. So if you're coming to a customer's door, you have to be confident. In the customer's eyes, you have to be the grandmaster, the expert, the AC whisperer, the furnace whisperer. You have to be just great at what you do, even if you're not sure what you're doing. In fact, especially if you're not sure what you're doing. So come in there and do not give the customer the impression that you don't know what you're doing. Come in there, take a look at it, ask them some preliminary questions, you know, like, when did this start happening? Be professional. If they see that you're professional, they're not gonna doubt you. Ask them, when did this start happening? How long ago? Has this ever happened before? Et cetera, et cetera. After they answered all those questions, start taking a look at the unit, maybe write down the model and serial, and if you're completely clueless, you're not sure what this thing is, it's some kind of a monster from a different country, tell the customer that you have to go into your van and look up some info on that unit, Go into your van and either look up the info or take your phone and call the senior tech and tell them exactly what you're looking at and get some instructions from them on what you should do next. And I've done this mistake before where I walked in and I tell the customer, 
wow, I've never seen this before. And you can see in their eyes right away, like a red flag goes up and they're like, ooh, this guy probably doesn't know what he's doing. And this is especially crucial if you're young. When I just started this job, I think I was 21 and married, but I looked like I was 15 and in high school. Sometimes I would knock on the door and Big Beard would open the door and look at me and be like, wow, is school out early today? And I'll be like, ha ha, so do you want your AC fixed or not? You know, he would let me in and I would do my thing. And since I looked like such a greenhorn back then, I mean, I still look pretty young, but back then it was a lot worse. That's actually, my eyesight was never that great to begin with, but that was the time when I actually started wearing my glasses pretty much full time because they made me look a little bit older. And that was also when I started wearing a baseball cap at work because that also made me look a little bit more professional, a little bit older. But I can't stress this enough. If you're a new guy, be confident. The customer could not doubt you. If the customer starts doubting you, the call just goes a lot worse from that point. It's worse for you and the customer because the customer gets paranoid. They're not sure if you know what you're doing. They're worried that you're gonna break their unit and they're actually over your shoulder the whole entire time now watching you to make sure that you don't do anything fishy. Whereas if you're confident, a lot of times the customer, once they realize like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing, he's asking good questions, they just leave you be and go do their thing. And at that point, you take a look at what's going on and you pull up your phone and you call the senior tech and let them know what's going on. Maybe even take some pictures and have them walk you through it. If it's totally above your head, then try to get somebody out to help you with the unit. So needless to say, I had some bad experiences when I thought that, hey, I'll be honest and tell the customer that I'm not really sure and I'll call a senior tech. Almost every time that ends bad. So just be very confident in the customer's eyes. Remember, you have to be the grandmaster. You totally know what's going on, even if you're not sure what's going on. Guys, and I'll just leave you with tip number 10, which is expect to make mistakes. It's gonna happen. You're gonna have fails in your career, and perhaps you're gonna have epic fails in your career. It's normal, it happens. Just get over it, move on, and become a better tech. I'm absolutely 100% certain that there's no tech that has never done a blunder before. I mean, if you're watching this and you've been doing this for a long time, I'm sure you're like me and there had to be at least one time in your career where instead of R22, you put in 410A or vice versa, instead of 410A, you put R22 in a system. Blunder, right? But then you have to evacuate the whole system, you have to pull a vacuum on it, weigh a charge back in, it wastes like a good couple hours just because of your one blunder and it throws your whole day into disarray. In fact, one of our older technicians, he's been doing this for like 30 years, just a month ago, he just did that mistake too where he added the wrong refrigerant and of course had to do the whole procedure. So you know, crap happens. One time I was putting in a fan limit, one of those spring loaded, it was an old furnace, you know, one of those long limits with the spring coil that kind of goes back and forth as the furnace is heating up. But anyways, I replaced this limit and there was this little tab on there that I had to break off to make the thing low voltage and I forgot to break it off. So of course I installed it, hook up all my wires, I turn the power on and I see a puff of smoke. And of course, I burnt out the thermostat, the control board and the transformer. So two hours later, I fixed all the damages and the furnace was working good. But, you know, people do make mistakes and that's what I wanna tell you. The takeaway is expect to make mistakes. It will happen. Don't beat yourself up over it. Try to learn from it. Try to never do it again and just move on, become a better tech. So most mistakes you can bounce back from, you can walk away from them, you can learn a lesson. But there are mistakes that you can't walk away from. So I wanna use this last opportunity to remind everybody, all the new guys, respect electricity. You gotta respect electricity because it can kill you. A few years ago, a technician went to do an inspection and the first thing he did is go down to the furnace and after he didn't come back for a while, the customer went to check on him and he found the technician dead on the floor. After some investigation, they found out that the whole return duct was energized. Either something was wired wrong or there was a short. I don't know how it happened, but the ductwork was energized and when he put his hand on it, he got electrocuted. And I don't know if you've ever been shocked before. I've been shocked a couple of times and it's not pleasant. It's actually a very scary experience. I mean, it feels like your whole body is buzzing and everything starts going dark and hazy. And I don't know, maybe you tried those little prank pens, you know, where you press the button and it shocks you, that buzzing feeling you get. It's like that, but it's amplified. It's a lot more intense. And of course it's 120 or 240 volts. 
throughout your whole body. And sometimes I'll be talking to some other technicians and he'll be telling me about his day and what kind of calls he had. And then he says, Jay, you know what? Today, I almost met my maker, man, because he got zapped by electricity. And I mean, this, like I said, can be very dangerous. There's a difference between getting shocked, electroshock, and between getting electrocuted. If you're electrocuted, you're dead. If you're shocked, that means you survived. And just one thing I want to point out, when you're getting shocked, your muscles contract. So if you're grabbing something, that's why it's always a bad idea to grab. If you latch onto something and it starts shocking you, your muscles contract and your hand kind of grips. And you can't let go because your muscles are contracted and electricity is not letting you let go of it. So unless a breaker trips or a fuse blows, you literally will be electrocuted to death. So one tip on that is when you're coming to an appliance for the first time, when you just come downstairs, the ductwork, when you touch things, just touch it with the back of your hand. That way, if it does shock you, you'll kind of be thrown back instead of locked onto it. That way, it'll just be a little shock. It'll be startled, but of course not dead, which is great. And the few times that I've been shocked, for the rest of the day, you really feel lightheaded and kind of out of it. But the next day, usually you're back to normal, unless it was a really severe shock and burned skin and all that. In that case, I really hope you went to the hospital to get that treated and looked at. And if you're going to be doing commercial work, there's more voltage, there's more amps, which is a lot more dangerous and there's a lot more possibility of arcing where electricity can actually jump from an electrical contact onto something metal. So one thing you want to get into the habit of doing if you're working with high voltage, high amp draw appliances or units is one, to wear gloves and two, if possible, like at a Chinese restaurant, use your two meter leads with just one hand and keep the other hand away. That way, if there is arcing and electricity goes into your body, it'll look for ground, right? Electricity is trying to go to earth It'll go into your hand and most likely it'll travel down your body and into your leg. Whereas if you have both of your hands at the appliance or whatever it is that you're working on in the unit, boiler, chiller, whatever it is that you're touching, if you have both of your hands, there's a high chance that the electricity will go into one hand, cross your heart and go into the other hand, which means it can actually stop your heart. And that of course is bad news. So, the two tips I wanna leave you for electrical safety. First of all, I mean, if you're not checking voltage or amp draw, whatever test that you're doing if you don't need the power on just always turn it off it's always safer that way always have the power off if you don't need it live to test something and try to get into a habit of touching equipment with the back of your hand for the first time just in case the off chance that it is energized with the back hand and if you can if you're working with high voltage stuff use one hand for both meter leads to check the voltage and if you've ever been shocked before if you could share your story in the comments below that would be awesome those shocking stories are actually great motivation for other people to respect electricity more so if you share your story that would be awesome and most of us hvac technicians will be working on this all week long every day and of course the more you're exposed to it the higher your risk is so try to get these safety habits into a habit so you're constantly doing them to hopefully never ever have to experience getting shocked or of course worse, even worse, getting electrocuted. Well guys, and unfortunately, all good things come to an end. That is all I had for you, the 10 tips for new guys in the field. I hope you found this video useful. And once again, if you're a guy watching this, if you're a veteran tech that's been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years, please do share your wisdom with us, for the with the rest of us in the comments below. That will be very helpful. That will be totally awesome of you. Please take that extra time to do so. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, consider subscribing for more content like this. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. And if you're still here, let me share a tip with you that's way off topic of what we were just talking about. But if you have Amazon Prime and if you shop a lot on Amazon, I do both, you should definitely get the Amazon credit card. By the way, I'm not sponsored to do this or anything. This is just personally my own opinion. Like four months ago, I finally got the Amazon credit card. I don't know why I didn't get it sooner since I shopped so much on it. In the last four months, I probably spent more than a thousand bucks on Amazon and I got 50 bucks back. So then next time I go shopping at Amazon, I can just use the gift or the cash reward money that I got from Amazon back on that same Amazon purchase. So it's pretty awesome. If you don't have one and you shop a lot on Amazon, you really should get one because it's 5% back on all your purchases and there's no annual fees. So really there's no downside, but the interest rate is high, just so you know. So you want to pay your balance in full every single month. Otherwise you're going to get hit with that interest rate and nobody wants that. If I don't forget, I'll put a link of the Amazon credit card in the description below. Anyway, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.